Good morning, Orchard Crest family. God bless you. It's good to see you here today. And I think we got a few folks still staying down in the fellowship hall. I don't know if they're down there protecting the food uh, or what. You know, we got to see, make sure. <laughs> no, I think they're down there getting everything ready. As you know, today we're uh, celebrating a very special day. Of course, every Sunday is with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But he gives us grace. And it's just amazing how that God blesses our life and our life is is just full every day as we live in the Lord with our struggles or whatever it is in life but today is one week ahead of time really uh, sister Evelyn she will be 106 years old next Sunday we're celebrating her 106 birthday today with a potluck dinner so we want everybody to stay we've got a big cake and and plenty of food and, and, and it doesn't matter whether you didn't bring anything or not please uh, the difference that's going to make is that some of us won't have to take anything back home so please stay and help us to eat that and to celebrate and to fellowship with one another and things as we uh, celebrate sister Ella. and you'll get a chance to meet her at the end of the service uh, if you have not seen her, and we'll do a blessing up here so that when we end up the church service, we'll go down and go straight through our uh, food line when you go down to eat. Our, our folks in the kitchen knows, and they'll be prepared. And that way you can get a table and get your food and things. And remember, if you got more than two pieces of chicken, you got one of Brother Odell's when he comes through at the last of the line there, you know. I'm messing with you. Um, but, oh, oh, that's the truth, huh? <laughs> uh, yeah, I was talking to you, Charles. That was a, one very culprit. No, I'm teasing. Um, but anyway, we want you to stay, please. We welcome our, those of you that are visiting with us today. Thank you for coming. We're so glad that you're here. And I um, want to share with you a few prayer concerns that we have. Uh, Shirley Haken her uh, sister, Marty, uh, uh, needs our prayers. Something about a, a recall on a pacemaker that she had, and she's going to have to have surgery to have that redone. And also her cousin, Sandy, I shared with you last week, that got uh, 30 40% burns on her body. Um, remember her out in California. Continue praying for Sister Betsy Caves. Uh, you know, Betsy was in a car wreck, and and continue to recover from that and and with all the other complications and stuff that she's been having and as we mentioned sister Evelyn hey we want to pray for her and that family pray for they're going to have a big birthday celebration next weekend families flying in is the reason why we're having to have it uh, a week early or a week later and we went with a week early here so that we could celebrate uh, together so we're thankful for her and her family and I'll just ask Brother Bill if you'll come, please, and bring our ushers for our offering this morning. While they're coming, is there anyone else? And just tell me quickly that we need to pray for today. And just... Okay. Okay. Okay, so pray for that young man. Anyone else, because our ushers are coming... Okay, your sister, Mary, okay, Charles' sister, Janice, the Phillips, and I called them last week, Tina, by the way, I never did get a call back or an answer on that, but I called and, uh, uh, just let them know to come. So pray for Rebecca, that Becky that was here and, and others on that. Brother Bill, come, brother, and lead us in a prayer this morning. Father God, we thank you for this beautiful Lord's Day. You made force to be in your house to worship you today, Lord. And we just thank you for all the blessings you poured out on each one of us, Lord. We just pray you keep us safe this evening and tonight as the storm may be coming in, Lord. And we just Pray this message you've laid on Brother Odell's heart will reach out and touch others. We just thank you for the ones that are here today and ones that are home and can listen and watching on Facebook. We just pray you be with them, Lord, and we just 
Pray you bless this offering, Lord, both the gift and the giver, and we just ask all these things in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Bill. Brother Philip, come on up, praise team, and help Brother Philip out. <laughs> well, I'm certainly glad to be here with you this morning. We're going to stand and we're going to sing, uh, There's Power in the Blood. Thank you for the sacrifice that Jesus gave for us. So we're going to sing about that this morning. Precious blood. 
Amen, Brother Philip. Praise team, thank you so much. John chapter 14, Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, then I will come again and receive you unto myself. Isn't that wonderful? That wasn't up there. That's not in the message today. <laughs> that was just for the song in my Father's house. You know, he has a place for me. If you have your Bibles with you, open them to Matthew chapter 13. We'll be reading verse 51 through verse 58 today. In the conclusion of a series of messages concerning the eight mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 13, verse 51 through verse 58. The eight mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Matthew beginning chapter 13 verse 51. Jesus saith unto them, Have you understood all these things? They say unto him, Yea, Lord. And of course just throwing us in, he's speaking to his disciples. The apostles, the Christians, the believers, those that, and listen. And then verse 52, Then said he unto them, Therefore, every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed thence. And when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, a prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many works there because of their unbelief. Would you pray with me? Dear Father, thank you for the blessed word. Thank you for Jesus our Savior and for the Holy Spirit. And we praise you today. As you sat upon the throne, you've never relinquished your power. And that, Father, you've given to us guidance today as to the direction for our lives if we would just follow. Speak to our hearts. Give us understanding. Be with those who are here as we all gather in this place to worship you in the house of God. This is your place. And for those who are watching by live stream, that you will speak to their hearts. And even now, that as you're drawing that net, Lord, to guide them to you, if someone's lost, may they be saved today. Or us as Christians, in recommitting ourselves to you and being empowered and strengthened, that we may be of service for your glory. Make us the shining lights, the salt that has not lost its savor. Give us understanding now of your word, and help us, Lord, that we might in whatever ways that we surrender ourselves to do your will. In Jesus' name, amen. The truths that were taught, we, in the scripture, in the previous parables, which was the hidden treasure, if you remember, and the pearl of great price, those were uh, number six and seven of the eight parables. Today, of course, the conclusion is the parable of the householder, number eight. These were things that Jesus spoke of and related to them about what it was to, about the hidden mysteries. He says, the, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto this. That was his uh, speech or 
whether it was the wheat and the tares of all the different things to give understanding to us. So when we look at this and we see the blessings of the kingdom of Christ that they truly are deemed so as to be the most uh, valued price of whatever, there's, there's nothing that can compare when you look at to say Jesus was that hidden treasure that uh, the great pearl of price was that of Christ that when you find him, you found everything. When you've got Jesus, you have everything. But unfortunately, many of us do not realize that within our life. We don't live our life that way. We're still pursuing things. We're still looking for all the different things. You know what I have found um, through the Bible and in my own personal life as I've looked back over 47 uh, years of ministry or thinking about um, all these different things of what uh, I see within churches and going to revivals and in crusades and, and different things is that it's kind of different about, you know, when we came to that conclusion of the sermon that Jesus said today that he did not many works there because of their unbelief. And as I've looked around, this was the whole thing of the gist of everything and the summary of what Jesus was saying. And I found over the years with churches and different places Sometimes in giving my testimony or you hear somebody gets out of prison and they share their testimony. Somebody's an axe murderer, whatever, the things. And they say, oh, what a glorious testimony, how God saved them. Maybe you grew up in a church and you, uh, your mom and dad was drug you to church. You were drugged when you went to church. You know, you went, doors had to be open and all the different things. And grew up in the Sunday school. And many people, and many people been in church all their life, 70, 80 years, 60 years, whatever. All the different things. And they'll say, well, I just don't have that testimony I just wished I had that testimony you know why is it that those who have become we become too familiar should I say this we get so familiar with the gospel that has no impact upon our life we sing the songs, they have no impact upon our life. We hear the message, it has no impact upon our life. It doesn't steer us to the excitement that it once did before we were saved. Because we have become so familiar with, oh, I've heard that before. I know that we become in the words of Christ because when God speaks to us, then it ought to be that he's speaking that fresh, once again, renewed word that he is saying to our hearts to encourage and to give us understanding of. Do you know a lot of times that it's those people that are most unlikely? Give you some examples. When we look at the, in the scripture, the woman of Samaria, you ladies just studied that not long ago in the Bible study. And to see unexpectedly that Jesus shows up, she's there. But look what happened, how her life was impacted when Jesus began to talk to her about this living water. And, you know, if you drew from me, you'll never thirst again and all the different things. And, man, her life is impacted. You'll worship me in spirit and truth. And, and she had come here is considered a sinful woman living with a man, many husbands and all the different, someone that you would not expect Christ to come to, let's say on the other side of those tracks. But yet, the impact of her life was when she went into the city and said, come, she had a testimony, she said, come and hear a man that's told me all the things about my life. Could this be the one, the Messiah? All the, it impacted her so much so that it drew other people around her who knew her and saw the difference in her life. People who, it seems like that the, the most unlikely to think that God would save them, that God would use them. Why is that? Zacchaeus, the publican, climbing up at a tree. He's a tax collector and he's wanting to see Jesus, but it wasn't anything in response. He had heard about him, but then Jesus sees him, comes down. Zacchaeus gets converted. He invites all of his friends to come and, and to the party, to the different things. He makes a commitment to say, if I've stole anything from anybody, I'm willing to pay back fourfold. That's a difference within your life when you have Jesus as your Savior. The impact of whatever happens. So, so why is it? And, and we could go on and on with all kinds of examples about the thief on the cross and the man that was born blind in John 9 and, and the apostle or Saul in Acts uh, chapter 9 when he 
gets this blinding light when Christ speaks to him and see the change. Here he was killing Christians responsible, arresting them, putting them in prison to see this change over. Isn't it amazing? It seems like that those who find Christ without seeking Christ usually have the liveliest joy. That are to think about that for a moment. I've been in church all my life. That might be what's wrong with church. Think about this for a moment. That we got so accustomed to tradition and to the things of church that we've missed out upon the most wonderful thing. Having church when we come to church. Not worried about all the things that goes around and making who's on this committee and who's doing this and all the different things of the church and, and the mechanism. Sure, you've got to have people there, but I want to tell you something. When we get our hearts right with God, we won't have to worry about who's filling those slots to be a Sunday school teacher or to be uh, a deacon in the church or to be this or that because it will be the calling of God within our life because we want to, when people look at us, we want them to see Jesus. We want them to see the joy of Christ within our life. And you know when that's not visible, when that's not seen, you know that's something that we've got to work on, isn't it? Because those people that we look at who are expected, the religious, when you look at them to see all the different ones of what they did within their life, that you will see that there was not as much joy. They would question they have too many. I got questions. I got this because it's coming. We try to figure it out. We try to do all those things rather than depend upon the power of God within our life to trust Him. So I want you to notice two things in today's message. Here in the parable of the good householder, which is intended really to complement and to complete all the other seven parables. Notice, first of all, verse 51. Jesus asked, have you understood all these things? Now, I think that would be intimidating. To ask and say, here, here are those who are the learned. These are the disciples. He's asking them because they had asked him, when you look at this, to notice, that, notice it's the will of Christ that we, we read, we hear, we see, we hear, we understand. Remember he said that he that hath eyes to see... Ears to hear, to give understanding for that thing. He turns around because before they would say, explain to us what about the wheat and the, and, and the tares. When they didn't understand. But this time Jesus asked him, says, do you understand what I've said to you? Concerning the mysteries, how that's inter intertwined and what it means to be a believer, a follower of me. How important it is that you find that treasure. Can you really say that you have the treasure, that treasure? You know what Matthew 6.33 says? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Amen. Did you notice that? Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Most of your life may be spent on pursuing things, to accumulate, to get, to have all these things. Jesus has gone through to show how that you can get intertwined and mixed and all these things. He's saying, this man sold everything he had with that hidden treasure he found in the field so he could buy that field and have that hidden treasure. That man, the merchant, finding that great pearl of price that he took and sold everything so he could buy that one pearl, have that pearl of price, and just say, you are to be willing to do whatever it takes within your life in order to know him, to have this treasure within your heart. And that are to be the most cherished thing within your life. You know, the biggest decision I ever made in my life is that when I gave my heart to Jesus. The biggest decision I ever made in my life, I've never forgotten it. I can't forget it. 
It was, it was so real, the experience. It was, it was tremendous of the things, of, of what happened, because, you know, that's the excitement that when you find that great treasure, that great price. So Jesus told them, and here as he was sharing with them, and saying, because this is the way to learn and grow. Have you, have you understood all these things? In Acts chapter 8, verse 26 through verse 40, you remember Philip when God pulled him out of Samaria and said, I want you to go um, back to this such and such place, follow the Holy Spirit. And he came up on a chariot where there was an Ethiopian eunuch. And Philip began to share with him because uh, he saw him reading as he was going along. And he said, do you understand what you read? How can I except some man explain it to me, he says. And then Philip joined himself. God led him there to share and to join into that. So again, it's saying understanding. Somebody says, I read, I, I've had people come up to me all the time and say, oh, I've read my Bible through twice this year. I read, I said, what did you understand about it? What, what, do, you, what do you know? What, what's your comprehension about? What's God saying to you concerning that? Because, I mean, we can pick it up and just like a newspaper, go just read through it, fast read, quick read, and to do it without it. You know, it's more important to read one verse and that verse of God and comprehend what that one verse says to your heart and let God's voice speak to you than it is to read one chapter or the whole book and then can't come off with anything. And you're like, well, I don't know. I don't, you know, I don't know what it said. I don't know all these. I just, I read it, and man, it it's all gets runs together. You're, you know, we can have pride in the fact that we read our Bibles all the way through. Jesus says, search the Scriptures and see if you think that you have life in them. The Scriptures tells you about the one that gives life. The Scriptures will lead you to the life giver, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 51, they answered, said, yea, Lord. And so we have reason to believe that what they said was true because when they didn't understand in Matthew 13, verse 36, concerning the wheat and the tares, they said, no, explain it to us. So when we look at the scope of this parable within itself, it's really with this question of whether they understood. Jesus wanted to say, do I need to go a little further and explain this to you? He said, do you understand? You know what Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians? To those who have been in church a long time and all the different things. I've read the Bible. I've done this and that. I've been in church all my life and things. And here, the, he said, some of you, he said, those of you that need to be teachers, he said, you're still needing to be fed on the milk bottle. You're still drinking. You're still on milk, not meat. Because of the fact that you won't go any further. You want to just stay there on, and, and just and, and, and be your babes in Christ. You, you, you're thinking in your mind, say, well, just as long as, if I can get my foot in the door to heaven, that's all I want. If I can just get my foot in the door, no, that's not good enough. That's like somebody saying when we were talking last Wednesday night concerning on uh, Fireside Chat, and I want to invite you to that if you've not been, at 6.30 every Wednesday night. One of the questions, I sat here and take questions and answer them in the Bible, and we're live streaming. And it was about that uh, being saved, said, uh, where a person, you know, says uh, that we're, uh, how was that, Brenda? S once saved, yeah, thank you. Once saved, always saved. Once saved, always saved, and that's all we think. Get that foot in the door. Once saved, always saved. Now I can do whatever I want to do. No, you can't. If you have the attitude of that being like that, of saying that now I'm saved, I can do whatever I want to, you probably never got saved in the first place. Because when we get saved, when we give our life to Christ, it's not that we want to do what we want to do. We surrender our will to his will, and we should pursue God's will for our life. We should be doing God's will within our life. So when Jesus asked them if you understood, and they said, yes, we do now, before they said, no, explain it a little further, he was giving them the opportunity to see if he needed to further instruct them. And that shows to us concerning these things of the kingdom of heaven that Jesus was willing to teach them. He wanted them to learn because later they're going to become teachers of other people. You see, if you learn it wrong, guess what's going to happen? You teach somebody else wrong. 
And I think that's what's wrong, excuse the pun, with the things that we do. Wouldn't it be wonderful that, that, that every Christian, if every Christian would learn the Word of God and share what they learned? But you see, the problem is that when we learn it wrong from people that comes in, and then it's handed, look what the, where the church is today. It's because we have, instead of multiplying, churches have been dying. They've been minus, they've been struggling, they've been on the place because, and now we're thinking what we do in our logical thinking is say the way that we grow this church, the way we do this or that, oh, we've got to get a young preacher in here, we've got to get, we got to get some things for the kids, we've got to have this and that, and we start trying to figure out, no, if you want to grow the Word of God, go share the Word of God, preach the Word of God, because the Bible says that except you be saved, you can't go to heaven, and God added to the church such as were saved. So if they're not saved, you don't want them added to the church. But the church is just packing them in that wants to bring in people that not, when they're not saved, and, and then they go through their routines of what they have learned about church. Some of it, unfortunately, has been learned in Sunday school. Some of it's learned in different ways of people's lives and what they reflected upon because they never taught the true word of God. I want to tell you something. You know me. I mean, shoe fits, I wear it. You know? I mean, if it hits me, I've got three fingers coming back here to me if I see it. And, you know, and I don't try to cover, cover that up to say whatever. I don't, it doesn't, I, you know, it doesn't matter. I, I do appreciate your thoughts and your opinions about what you say. And you may, dis we can agree to disagree without being disagreeable. But in saying, you know, if I hit, and I'll give you the example to say if I hit on divorce, I'll say divorce is sin. Remarriage is sin, but it's not the unpardonable sin. You know, I've been divorced, I've been remarried, I'm remarried, and all those different things. I don't try to cover just because I'm divorced and remarried to say, oh, no, that's not wrong. No, it is wrong. But sometimes it may be more right than wrong for some people that live through hell within their life and they have no love and no joy and make it hard upon the kids within the family and different things. And sometimes you've got to make two choices. And that may be just like in the election, that you've got to choose between two people, says, says evil and, and, and more evil. You know, it may be in all kinds of things, choices that we make in life. But we want God's will to be done within our life following it. And Jesus is trying to teach us to follow the truth he wants to do you understand that was the thing that he was emphasizing with him you know we have to remember those who are to instruct others have to be instructed themselves if a priest's lips must speak knowledge his head must first have knowledge, but then his heart must feel the passion of God's word, and his ears must hear. Romans 10, verse 14 through 17 says, How shall they then call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, as Isaiah says. Lord, who has believed our report? And in verse 17, Romans chapter 10, So then, God says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The instruction of a gospel minister, preacher, pastor, teacher, must be about the kingdom of heaven, and that is the business that God calls us. Not for self-proclamation or self. And the Apostle Paul makes that clear in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 through 16. And I'm not going to read all the verses, but Paul said, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherein you are called. And, and walking where to do that, to fulfill. And that's not just preaching or teaching or whatever. And he goes on, he says in verse 11, He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, the edifying of the body that he intended, as he said, when you get saved and Christ begins to help you to mature in your walk through his grace and mercy to help you so that you can help others. But if you don't learn, if I don't learn, then I'm going to teach wrong. And unfortunately, there are people, oh, I 
hear them all the time. There are people that they teach, they're Sunday school teachers sometimes. And they never clarify, give scripture as to their belief. I believe this. I, I don't believe that. But this is what I believe. Or sometimes people sit in class and every time say, well, why do you believe that? Well, this is why I believe it. But you know, if it isn't in the Bible, then it's false. It's fake. It's not from God. So people need to, you need to challenge that. Me as a pastor, a preacher, I tell you why I believe it and show you in the Bible. And I welcome anybody to come and say anything, anytime. I welcome you to come and to say, well, Brother Odell, I don't think you said this right. I don't think this is that. I'd say you're a coward if you don't come to me and talk to me about it. You hear me? Because you come, you come, you say, and the same thing is true if you don't address a Sunday school teacher. Unless you believe what they believe, and then you'll say, well, I believe that because so-and-so said it. But where does so-and-so get it? You don't want to believe. Next Sunday, don't you miss it. I'm going to preach. Lord willing, I laid through the night here this week. God's speaking to my heart about preaching who's really your father next Sunday morning. Who's really your father? You be sure you are here for that time. So I want to say to you that when you come to the place to hold people's feet to the truth, Jesus was saying, because you don't need to be teaching anything that you don't understand. And you don't need to tell people about Jesus if you've never experienced Jesus within your life. That's why so many people are confused. They're caught up into those things to do it. So when he, in this sense of, if you'll notice, a person may be a great philosopher, they may be a great politician. However, if they're not called, they're not instructed in the kingdom of heaven, they will make a bad minister, preacher, pastor, teacher because they aren't called of God. Paul said, walk worthy of the vocation wherein you are called. He compares them to a good householder who brings forth out of his treasure things new and old fruits from last year and from the new year. And he says, and as we read in 2 Timothy, Paul writes chapter 3, verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The word perfect means complete. Not perfect like sinless. It means to be complete. That when you have all this knowledge, old experiences and new observations all have their use. In other words, live and learn. Old Testament goes together with the New Testament. The Old Testament points toward the cross. And you've got to understand the Old Testament. The New Testament is pointing back to the cross and the life of Christ. And now we're with expectancy looking for the return of Christ. That he'll be coming back from glory, from heaven, according to the Bible, of what we learn and to understand. So we have to be careful to understand the word of God, that it does not change, nor shall we or should we ever try to change what God's word says. How should we make use of what has been entrusted to us? Here in verse 52, Jesus says, the householder brings forth out of the treasure things new and old, and he brings forth laying up as in order to lay out for the benefits of others, not for ourselves, but for, to also benefit others. Many people have a talent, but they bury it. The Bible considers such as unprofitable servants. If you don't use what you have, you heard that expression says, you know, if you don't use it, you lose it. I've heard people talking about different gifts that they have, whether it's playing the piano or playing, you know, I used to play a little on the guitar, but I haven't in a long time, and, but I couldn't play with the hoots. So don't even ask me to play because I, I can go through about three or four chords and that would be it, just in limited. Even though my mom and dad both played and, and I did back at, when I got out of high school and was doing all those things, but just, you know, I just, you know, yeah, I know, I know. You ride a bicycle, you never forget, right? And you get out there, and when me and Deborah tried that, we got us some bikes, and I'll tell you one thing. I may not have forgot to pedal and stuff like that, but I sure lost that balance of what I had as I'm getting older to ride it. So 
you have to use. Don't bury your talent. Use. And this was what the householder said. He brings forth those things. And what he is saying to us is that as a householder, this is what he's teaching. To sum up all of these parables, say, you take and use what you have for the glory of God. And it was interesting that Jesus wrapped that up with this in verse 54. 53 through 58. Notice how Jesus' friends and family rejected him here. He left that place after teaching them. He said, yeah, we understand that. And he was saying, this is the parable of the householder. That he takes and he offers up and brings. He uses both new things, old things, etc., and things. And they said, and he was saying, what that householder would do is he holds it in reserve to benefit all that he's learned. The treasures you have in your heart. Jeremiah said, you know, I'm not going to speak anymore in the Lord's name. I'm not, I'm not going to speak for the Lord anymore because he kept getting rejected. He was called the weeping prophet. Jeremiah was. I'm, what's the use? I've heard preachers say, I'm not going to preach anymore. I mean, I know stories about preachers and different things of what they've done and, and to share and how they've been treated by churches. And yeah, I know some stories about how preachers have taken advantage of some churches and do this thing and that. And, and people use, there's all kinds because no Christians that I know and there's no one in here that I know of that is perfect. We have only one perfect, and that's Jesus. But I know that as we come to this place and in, in understanding how that somehow or another this Jesus comes to this place of using what you have for God's glory because this is the treasures you have. We are to be sharing it. And so Jesus turns around and goes, and he goes to the synagogue in verses 53 through 58 into his own country. And... In verse 54, it says his own countrymen become astonished. And what we have here is he's going, he went about, Jesus went, they knew his life, they knew everything about him, but his own countrymen had rejected him once before, yet he came to them again. That once before is when he looked out over Jerusalem, he said, I would have called you like a hen would her brew, and, but you would not come. And Jesus would weep over them because they rejected him. Here he goes back again. I know, I know, I can't count the many times that the Lord has come to me as I have drifted from him in my Christian walk and Christian life and the Holy Spirit has convicted me and wooed me because I grieve the Holy Spirit or whatever when I reject doing God's will in my life and, and I'll find that drawing that God's bringing me back to the altar like Abraham going back to Bethel to the house to where he met the Lord to get on the altar and to pray and recommit, rededicate our lives because we have failed in the sufficient of what we should do to instruct others about Jesus to share with them within our life and Jesus went and he said here they rejected they were astonished and notice how they expressed their contempt when he taught in the synagogue he went he went to the church they had the local assembly it said they were astonished not that they were taken up with his preaching, admired his doctrine, or anything. There were two things that they reprimanded him with. One was his lack of academic education. Isn't that interesting? And sometimes that's what churches look for today. And I think that's where a lot of churches are failing when they're looking for, they're trying to find some preacher. And I have, I have a Bachelor of Theology. I have a Master of Divinity. It's hanging on my wall. But what I have is a born-again experience and a calling of God. And that's the most important thing in my life. I'm thankful for it because I've learned a lot. I've, but I've learned a lot in pastoring of experience and things. But, you know, I could have done none of that. I couldn't have went to the school, the college, the seminary. I couldn't have done that. I couldn't have pastored churches and, and, and been uh, successful or doing or be at peace or to handle some of the deals. And stuff. If, if it hadn't been for the call of God... And the fact that Jesus say, uh, you know, I'll never forsake you, I'll never leave you, to go to be a place. But Jeremiah, here in that point in his life, he was saying, I'm not going to, I'm just going to keep it contained. And then he said, but the word of God was burning so much within his heart, he could not contain it, he had to tell it. And I would pray to God that that would happen to us here at Orchard Crest Baptist Church and to every Christian that is born again that said, I've got to tell the world what Jesus has done for me. I've got to share it. But you're going to face some rejection. 
And maybe that's the problem, is that maybe you've been rejected and you've just stopped doing that. Maybe that's why we try new methods and new things, you see, to do that. It's because of rejection. They found a way to reject Jesus because of his lack of education. They said, verse 54, whence has this man these mighty works? You know, to look at it. And, and you look at, the next thing was, look at the meanness of there. They begin to explain it and concerning his family relations. In verse 55 through 56, they begin to scold him about his father. and said, is not this the carpenter's son? It wasn't so much that being a carpenter was uh, at the low place of, of uh, vocational calling or whatever that Joseph, Jesus' stepfather. But as far as they were concerned, because they didn't believe in him as the Messiah, they didn't believe that he was the son of God. They didn't believe those things, so they looked at him as being Joseph's son. You see what sometimes the delusion will be that when it comes upon people that they'll never believe. In fact, that's what he said, wasn't he? He said he couldn't do my, many mighty works because their unbelief. That might be why that there's some things not happening in your life. When you consider the fact that I asked God for this, I asked God for that, it just doesn't happen. I hear people... A lot of times over the years just complain about health problems and financial problems and, and this and that and it doesn't seem to be any answer or whatever to come into a place to say and say, hey, duh, wait a minute. Hold on. Maybe it's at the point to where it's because maybe it's a sense of the, the lack of your commitment of belief in Jesus that with God all things are possible. And all things are possible, the Bible says, to them that believe. They chided him with his father, his mother, Mary. Can you imagine here they're talking about Mary? And then they went on to his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, Judas, and said all of his sisters, we don't have their names. All of those that were Jesus' half-brothers and half-sisters in verse 56. So Jesus' response in verse 57 through 58, he didn't let it really trouble his heart. I'm sure it saddened him, but you know it was no surprise to him because he's Jesus. He already knows what they're going to do, what they're going to say, but he went there. Yes, sometimes he comes to us, and he already knows what our response is going to be, what we're going to say how we're going to try to fix it or whatever. And, but he comes to us. I'm, I'm thankful that he does, aren't you? I seen a guy one time that came to me after a revival, and he kept coming every night. I was preaching a revival up in the mountains, of, up in Ohio, up in the mountains, near West Virginia. And a guy came, and he was saying, he said, I just don't feel God anymore. I just can't hear him. I keep coming to church, and I just can't hear him. He would come and, and say, because all the things he said he used to, and he just shut God off, and he just quit speaking to him with all the sin and things within his life. And he said, I just can't. I just can't hear the Lord. And I was so thinking, and I just said, and having prayer, I said, listen, you have got to surrender your all. If you want to hear God, take down all the barriers. Quit the facade. Well, I'm not as bad, Lord, as some of them. Now, I know I did that, but, but I, you know I didn't really mean that. I'd start justifying. Stop trying to, to find a place to fit in why you did what. Sin is sin. And the wages of sin is death. And if we end that sin within our life, it's going to cause us to die in this connection, this closeness to God. And what's going to happen is we've got to get to the place like David said, my sin is ever before me in Psalms 51, verse 3, to have that to know as it's speaking to our hearts. Jesus knew what they were going to do and what they were using and talking about. They looked the other way. They were under this delusion of those things. So his response to them was just simply, he moved on within his life in, in verses 57 through verse 58. In Hebrews 12, verse 2, Paul says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. 
Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against him, lest you be weary and faint in your minds. You have not yet resisted unto blood and strife unto sin. This was the heroes of faith chapter. Of all the people in Hebrews chapter 12 that went through all kinds of different things and to say because sometimes we say I can't do this and I can't do that. My dad always said can't never did anything unless it tried. And you say and sometimes we complain about all the different things that we have within our life and said you have not yet resisted unto blood. If it means dying in your predicament. Paul says Lord take this from me that's just troubling this 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 messenger from Satan that's just me and I could do so much more for you and God said my grace is sufficient for you Paul asked him three times things within your life you see when we look to Christ the author and finisher of our faith when we see what Jesus went through how he suffered and he didn't deserve and we think about all of our suffering all the different things do you understand what Jesus said the most precious thing you have is the salvation of your soul what would a man give for his own life what price could be paid any greater than that which has been paid, and it's paid in full? That Jesus laid down his life. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, Paul says, What? Know you not that your body is not your own? You're bought with a price. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. He's talking to believers, not talking to those that are lost. He's talking to those that are saved. So what we do is we need to bow down and we need to worship him. We need to come in together. We need to commit ourselves. You know, if Jesus had 12, and the impact upon the world, and that 12 became 120, and that 120 became 3,000, and then 8,000, and then on and on, and as it's multiplied into millions across the world, what if we, as the army of Christ, the soldiers of Christ, found the commitment, the understanding about the mysteries of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and realize the value, the true value of what we have. To understand what God wants in our life to do. In Matthew 13, 57, Jesus said, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country and his own house. Where you came from, what you do. Sometimes you go and say, I can't talk to my family. I can't talk, you know, all these people, they don't believe it. I used, I used to, I'd have people say, why don't you come back home and pastor? Why don't you pastor close to here or somewhere in some of the churches to where, uh, yeah, I used to <laughs> run around and, um, I mean, I'd like to. I could have stayed, I had some old fishing buddies and all the different ones and, and people and being there and I thought I could be a good witness for the Lord and stuff. But, you know, you, know, some, you see, what they're going to do is pull you down. Because they don't, they don't really believe in any change in your life. You still look the same to me. You know, to do those things. And before long, you'd be pulled back into. And then a hog goes back into the wallow. A dog returns to its vomit. All there because of struggles. Because we're weak in our flesh. Admit it. We're weak and we give in to our flesh. And to do it. And the, the, the areas of temptation. Even in our own household. I can remember my family. We'd go out and... And we, we like to shoot clay pigeons and um, sporting clays and things. And I used to do that when I had my service stations drinking. And I've won a few contests along the way. Uh, but like some of you that's bought lottery tickets that you have wasted a lot of that money. You tried, though. I'll give you credit. I don't know of anybody. I'm not opposed to it. I'm just saying if you win it, give the Lord his portion. The devil's had it long enough. But I'm just saying that when you do it, I'm saying, but I do it, and we and, and it was, you know, it's price and stuff, and we go, I go to some tournaments and shoot uh, sporting clays and do that, and sometimes we'd practice down on my grandfather's farm, and we'd open up a cooler of beer and stuff, and and drink. That's what we did, and all, you know, bologna sandwiches and stuff. Sit out and have a good old time, talk to grandpa and dad and uncles and cousins and brothers and all family gathering that was our way because remember I grew up under country music and a bootleg and moonshining grandfather and uh, but after I surrendered to preach they'd bring me over a coal and I said and I'd surrendered to preach but I was still trying to go and before I went off to Bible college and they said here have a beer and I said no no I don't drink anymore and I said I'll drink a coke or Pepsi or something like that and I'd take uh, 
that in a can or something. They said, we won't tell anybody. He said, church folks won't ever know. Yeah, you know that, isn't, that the thing, isn't that the kind of the thinking? Well, no, you know, nobody, you just, God knows. There's not one thing you or I ever do or think of that God doesn't know within our hearts. And they said, so being a witness, but it was constant for them because it made them, and my friends, some of my friends, when I wouldn't do the things that I used to do with them, I tried because I wanted to win them to Christ. I wanted to influence. Of course, they didn't want to hear me preaching to them or saying, man, what God had done. I said, no, I used to. Come on, let's go out or go do this and stuff. Because if any man be in Christ, what? He's a new creature. And old things are, and all things become new. That's what Jesus was teaching us about the kingdom of God is our focus has got to be upon what we have gained. I haven't given up anything. I have gained so much more. I've gained so much more in Christ. What a treasure and what a pleasure that it is and has been to serve the Lord. Do I deserve it? Nope. Pastors in big churches. I didn't deserve it. I've been to several foreign countries. I've had the pleasure of seeing and preaching in foreign countries. God protected me, watched over me. I've been over places where the airplane lost an engine 600 miles over the Pacific Ocean. We had to turn around with one engine coming back and it falling. And we was all singing Amazing Grace. And it is well with my soul as we were singing on the plane as the preacher was leading and it was dark of night coming and getting back to the Philippines and just barely being over the top coming in and saying we could just we, we have one engine and we thought it was going down. There was there was rescue vehicles out. They told us that we just had some technicalities. But if you've ever been on something that is trying to climb, but you have the sensation of it falling. And we knew the plane never leveled off and we knew something was wrong that it was doing it. In 1985, and as it was like this, and all at once, and there was about uh, 80 of us that were, as evangelists, come together from the United States to go to Philippines. I was fortunate enough to be invited to be a part of, participate, to go and to preach across the, the nation of the Philippines, Mindanao Islands, and stuff. Saw a thousand people saved in the crusade I preached, going every night, baptizing. That was that place where I went to baptize some up in a little Muslim area in a valley and walked walk in the water, and a big old water buffalo come up and scared me to death, and I walked on water. I was just like going. I mean, it was just like, it's amazing the experiences that God has for you within your life. If you don't chicken out, if you have faith, because with faith all things are possible to those that believe in our so I remember as we were praying, saying, well, if this is it, I never get, we couldn't call on the phone to call your family to say, hey, we may not make it. I could envision those people at the World Trade Centers and different things may not, may not be able to get back, you know, to make it there. But I can tell you this, if something happens to me today, I know where I'm heaven bound. And I look forward to that place because I am still laying claim to that treasure that's more precious to me than anything else, and that's Jesus. I've not forgotten what it meant when he found me. I didn't pursue him, but he pursued me. No man can come to me, Jesus says, unless he is drawn. And as you feel the tugging of the Holy Spirit within your heart, within your life, I want to invite you to respond to him today as he leads you to do, whether to be saved, to rededicate your life publicly, privately there in your own heart, join the fellowship. This year. Just obey the Lord. He'll take care of the rest. Pray with me. Thank you, dear Father, that no matter what the world says and the rejection of friends or family or what anybody else is thinking, Help us not to do what pleases them, but help us to do what pleases you, Father. Forgive us of our sins and strengthen us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. And Lord, as we sing in this invitation moment, 
Help us to make the surrender, the commitment of our hearts that will draw us not just closer to you, but that will enable us to walk for you in the days ahead to bring glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me, please, as we sing together in the invitation? If you're in the back of the church, the front, the middle, I'll meet you right here at the front. Nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. But I know, do you? I have believed it and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. We'll sing one other verse. It'll be the last verse I unless someone comes. Not how this saving faith to me he did impart, nor how believe. Deborah's praying with our dear friend Betsy here. And I just want to, you know, as God is speaking to your heart, that you would just trust him and have that peace. That was Paul's answer. I know whom I have believed. After saying, God said, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. Can you say that? I know whom I believe. I know what I believe. And I've committed it unto him against that day. Isn't that great? And then you have that peace within your heart. Well, it's so good to have each of you with us today. Evelyn and Rita and Bill, would y'all sit out for a moment? Would y'all be seated for just a moment, please? And we're going to have the blessing, and we'll leave out here in just a moment. But while we're praying, and, and if you need to see me before church, can I meet you all right here somewhere? I maybe go around that way. I guess Rita would be the best. However, you guys, yeah, he's going to go around the back and come up here. Yeah, just come, if y'all can come up here with me. Um, Sister Evelyn, going to be okay without her walker there? Have you got it? Okay, Bill's got it. All right. And uh, yeah, maybe if she'll come, come on up here, Sister Evelyn. Can you come up here with me? People on live, yeah, people on, on, people have not, yeah, people have not, they don't know, seeing, seeing someone 106 years old, walks to Sunday, comes to Sunday school, can walk around in church and come up here beside your pastor, because this is an honor for me, there's, I don't know of any preachers that pastor such a lovely, sweet lady as you, can you come over in front of me here, and, and just right beside me, Evelyn, and turn around here, and just right here. And I want to say to our folks, and some of your family may even be watching us live stream. They're, they're going to be here next week, you know. Yeah, they're going to have a big birthday party for you, the rest of them. Oh. Now, Rita and Bill, your son, daughter and son, uh, how many children do you have? I had six. And I have three boys and three girls. And uh, so how many's living? All five are still living. One is going to be at the Lord. 1995. So you still got five kids living. This lady, Sister Evelyn, will be next Sunday officially 106. We're one week ahead of time. We're celebrating ahead of time her 106th birthday. We got a big potluck dinner, big cake down there in the fellowship hall for you and all. And I just want to say happy birthday to you. Ooh, 
And Philip, can we sing up here with a pen a happy birthday to Evelyn right here? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Evelyn. Happy birthday to you. We welcome you, and I'm going to have you guys to go ahead and make your way to the kitchen. And we'll be having our blessings, so you go with Rita and Bill. And go on down, and we'll meet you down there at the fellowship hall when we do that. And we'll give them a little head start so they can get a chance. And um, uh, any of the rest of the different folks, so we'll want you. We will invite you. Be sure to stay. we got plenty of food, so we want you to stay with us as we're having fellowship together. But we, ha we I mean, that's just so unusual. You are not able to have. And this guy over here, I know his birthday's on, and I can understand that on Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so it takes a few more years to get there, Phil. Um, but anyway, I love you. Uh, word from anyone before we go today. Been good to be in the house of the Lord, hasn't it? And uh, I appreciate each of you. We had a wonderful time. Like I say, don't forget uh, Bible study or that we have together, Fireside Chat. It's spontaneous. Just however you, you provide the questions. I already had somebody said, we, I've, I've got a question for you. And, uh, but we'll start give biblical answers as to the questions that you have. We have a good time and use it as something else. So one question sometimes leads to another question. So you come. There's no wrong question so you can ask. And we do it all in the spirit of love. Don't know. Sometimes I have to say I don't know. Let me look at that. Let me hold that over for next week. Thank you. Hadn't happened too often though, has it? But occasionally it might happen i'll leave myself room paul just in case but uh so sometimes that does and also the the finance committee will be meeting at 5 45 if you're on that we're preparing our church uh budget getting everything together so uh they'll be meeting 5 45 wednesday night sister joy and uh, be here before our fireside chat um we'll have a business meeting the first sunday night of december to approve uh, officers, teachers, and our uh, budget for 2022 on December the uh, 5th on Sunday night at 6 p.m. So you'll be getting more information on that. We'll see. Our church council generally meets, and we, in team leadership, build things together, have questions compiled, uh, just trying to follow the Lord and to do that. So any questions before we leave? Any word? Just as soon as the teacher leader can get some free time to study, to, to find I've got a book actually that's going to be ordered that 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 I'm I've got that I'm looking at and it's going to be about the ten men in the Bible like the women's looking at the ten women of the Bible, so it'll be looking at ten men, uh, Charles, and I'm thinking Charles that we might men like to eat, and I'm thinking brother Bill, you know y'all used to have breakfast on Saturday morning once or something like that, didn't you? And I'm, I'm thinking maybe well, let's do that. You know, when we have our Bible study, let's have breakfast. Let's beat those ladies. Some ladies, you know, they do. But, uh, but this, let's, we'll, do, uh, we'll do it where we can meet like on a Saturday morning or something and uh, have breakfast and a Bible study time and fellowship together once a month when we get started. But we started back Wednesdays and stuff and doing so. We'll just let the Lord lead on that, okay, to do it. All right, let's stand together and let